Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I am Tara Setmayer and this is the Rick Wilson. Rick, we're 15 days away. 15. Hey, folks. 15. We sure are. I can't believe it. It, it doesn't even feel real. wake up. <laughs> 15 <laughs> days away. And millions and millions and millions of people have already voted. Like to the tune of 29 million, I think it yep. is now. Every day it goes up a couple million more. Which right is for today. Awesome. Uh, that's good news for our side of the aisle, things that are going on here. So we're excited about that. Keep voting. Keep it up. Um, as always tonight, you can reach us and ask questions at hashtag ask the breakdown. We have a great guest for you. We have uh, Dr. Jennifer Murchia, who is a historian and the author of the book Demagogue for President. So she's coming in. So if you want to Zoom us, ask us questions, there's the information on screen and we will get to those a little bit later. You can also still call and go old school and leave us a voicemail. At, uh, I think we have that too. And Steve Schmidt will be joining us tonight. There's our there's the voicemail, I love it. We love to hear your lovely voices. Uh, Steve Schmidt will also be joining us tonight as well with his wise words of wisdom as we head into the final days of this campaign. So here we are. Like I said, we're 15 days to go. We've got a, a, about 220,000 dead Americans. We're setting records with more COVID infections, um, warnings from health officials and and uh, Dr. Fauci and others about uh, how what the winter's going to look like. This could be a rough six to 12 weeks. And that's of course, thanks to the failed leadership of the president of the United States. Joe Biden, the actual adult in the race, he is preparing, he's got his head down, preparing for the second last debate uh should have been the third debate but we all know what happened to the second one uh coming up this thursday while trump is running around barnstorming the country with his super spreader tour and he's attacking everyone from dr fauci to the press again he's calling for everybody to go to jail he's out completely out of control and while his campaign is flailing about he's also trying to change the topics for this thursday's debate so Meanwhile, here are a few helpful hints and tips for the president. Tools for the job. The American presidency. Being the president of the United States can be a difficult job, especially when you've failed the American people in so many ways. But even in the worst of times, a great president is always equipped with the tools to help protect his fragile ego. What kind of tools? Why, self-delusion, of course. Lesson one, what to do when you lose the first debate. Accuse your rival of using an earpiece. The Trump team asked to inspect the ears of each debater. Accuse your rival of juicing. He's on some kind of an enhancement. Accuse your rival of having unfair help from the moderator. Chris was terrible. He was protecting Biden the whole night. Lesson two, how to cover your ass. If you find yourself accidentally suggesting that a certain state's governor should be locked up, even after militiamen were arrested for plotting to kidnap her, send out your son's wife to say it was just a joke. He was having fun at a Trump rally. Remember, the best jokes are the ones you have to explain. And finally, lesson three, what to do when the rats jump ship. We all have a good chance of winning the White House. I'm now looking at the possibility of a Republican bloodbath in the Senate. When your party's grandees begin cautiously backing away from you, just remind yourself, these guys refuse to convict in the Senate. They can't wash off your stink, no matter how hard they scrub. <laughs> there is nothing better than a good film strip to give the president some helpful hints on trying to dig his ass out of the latest hole he has dug for himself. Today was a particularly manic and over-the-top day, Tara. I mean, we had, we had this guy so completely unhinged. He was screaming at reporters that, they should be, that, they should, that they're criminals. He, his list of people he wants to lock up is growing quickly. It's sort of in the Ceausescu range now, not just the sort of ordinary uh, Trumpian range. And, and he is completely, uh, at every public event, he has gone completely rip shit, and now he's trying to change the terms of the debate. 
and 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 he is he's attacking Dr. Fauci, which I know you had some thoughts about earlier, in in probably one of the most insane political plays I've ever seen. All while, by the way, their campaign is pulling down their media buys in more and more states. The RNC is is going up with some money for Trump, but not nearly enough. And we were leaked a document this afternoon from a major ad buying firm that said the Trump campaign's credit is absolutely no good, cash only, no credit at all, cash on the barrel head, or no digital ads. So it is wow. a uh, it, it is not a great not a great. It's already been a bad week for Grandpa Ranty, as I like to say. So, <laughs> and it's only anyway, Monday. The, the attacks on Fauci, I think, are fascinating. Yeah, this uh, anyone who watched sixty minutes. Well, before I even talk about Fauci, the fact that an ad firm, an ad buying firm, is saying that the Trump campaign's credit is no good is just another microcosm of what we say in politics all the time: is that the the way someone runs their campaign is usually indicative of how they'll how they'll govern. And everything that Donald Trump has done in his first campaign, in his business life, he brought the he brought being a shitty businessman into his campaign the first time, brought it into the presidency, and now into his reelection. It, it, it's just amazing how that conventional wisdom is still true. Now, speaking of conventional wisdom, yep. it's not wise to attack someone who has twice the popularity that you do. That would be Dr. Anthony Fauci who has spent five decades serving the country and be, uh, as a world-renowned epidemiologist. And he has like 80% approval. People trust him. He's probably the most trusted man in America right now as we go through co this COVID nightmare. And Donald Trump has decided that he is going to attack him and call him an idiot. Yes, that Dr. Fauci, who helped with AIDS and other major vaccines for other major epidemics, Ebola, Ebola you know, just things. a couple little accomplishments in his life. And Donald Trump went on a rant during a during a campaign staff call this morning, where the, where um, journalists were listening in, and called him an idiot and said that the American people are just tired of this COVID thing. You know, they're tired of it. And you know, Fauci, he's a nice guy, but he's been around for five hundred years. He literally said that. And that if he had listened to Fauci and these other idiots, that there, there would be 500,000 dead Americans. Narrator, that's not true. Trump then doubled down, <laughs> tripled down on it. He's attacked Fauci like three times today. This is absurd, okay? And this is clearly not what his campaign wants him to do. Attacking the number one epidemiologist, doctor, and then going after Joe Biden and saying somehow this is an insult, saying that Joe Biden, if you elect Joe Biden, he'll listen to those scientists. Like, that's a bad thing. Heaven forbid. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, he's already by writing the way, the By the way, ad. I just want to make a note. Yeah. I just want to make a note for our audience tonight as we do it uh, every night. Um, Steve and I are on the set close by, not wearing masks tonight. That is because we are in a very tight COVID bubble. We are tested constantly. Um, I, get, uh, I get stuff rammed up my nose far more often than I'd like to, 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 to uh, remember. Unlike Donald Trump Jr., different kind of thing. But we are tested constantly. We take it seriously. We encourage all of you to take COVID seriously as well. You've got to make sure that you are masked. Do your hand washing. Do your social distancing. Uh, October is going to get much worse. They have the, the mismanagement of this crisis has extended now into October. The second bounce of this disease is coming. So again, the reason we're not wearing masks on set, and we will put them on immediately when we walk off set, is because we are in a very tight pod. And everybody on the set is in the same pod. And uh, it's like a fraternity house, only only with more ads. So anyway, uh, Tara, I'm sorry, I wanted to get back to, to your discussion. No, no, that's uh, on okay. That with Fauci. I, I agree with you completely. It's insane to attack a beloved national figure. Um, and I read a little piece this afternoon in the Washington Post. After five decades in government service, Anthony Fauci, for the first time, has to have armed security all the time. Yeah, it was in the 60 Minutes I can't piece. imagine why. I'm sure, I'm sure it's a mystery as to why he needs armed security now. You know, if, so, if anyone watched it, was, it what, what's, what precipitated this rant by the president was the fact that uh, Anthony Fauci, Dr. Fauci, has been speaking out a bit more frankly about what's going on. He called the White House Amy Coney Barrett event a super spreader event. 
Um, he's been contradicting the president um, pretty regularly now because the health crisis has become so grave. And he was on 60 Minutes last night and, with his wife, and they talked about how they had to have security now. They have armed security, and they rolled B-roll of them uh, walking because he, he used to run, now he walks every day with his federal guards because of the death threats that they're getting. Not only him, but his family, his wife, and his kids. The, it, this is absurd. Yeah. For what? Because he's talk, speaking the truth about the fact we need to wear masks and socially distance so that we can get a handle on a, on a global pandemic that we didn't know about a year ago. It's abs it's absurd. And meanwhile, you guys, you know, Rick and, and others are being responsible by wearing masks and following the, 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 the proper protocols. The, the White House has elevated this Dr. Scott Atlas, who is a, basically he reads x-rays, okay? He's a neuro neuroradiologist. He reads x-rays. He's not an epidemiologist. He doesn't have anything to do with epidemics and infectious diseases. This is the guy that's now running the coronavirus task force and who has the president's ear. And he had to, he tweeted out about how masks aren't really reliable and Twitter took down the tweet because it was factually wrong and could do harm. That's who the president's ear, who has the president's ear now. And Dr. Deborah Burks, remember her scarf, her? Yeah, she has complained. She went to the vice president's office and complained and wanted to get rid of this guy, but to no avail. So because we have now a quack doctor, who Trump plucked from Fox News, leading the charge, we're continuing to be in this mess. So we're just two weeks from election day and we have a little COVID message. Roll the tape. You turn on CNN, that's all they cover. COVID, COVID, pandemic, COVID, COVID, COVID. Uh, uh. You know why they're trying to talk everybody out of voting? People aren't buying it, CNN, you dumb bastards. They're not buying it. That's all they talk about. That's your president of the United States, folks. Apparently, we're all the dumb bastards, and... The journalist should be criminalized and Joe Biden should be locked up. And we're, we're the jerks because we want to be safe. It's outrageous, Rick. It really is. Well, with that, I guess we should jump to the B block and uh, segue into the B block, if you take my meaning. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so <laughs> Bullshit. I can't get enough of the segue. Oh my God, I love the new one. I love it. You never quite know what you're going to get from us. It's great. You uh, never do. You guys. never quite know. Let's bring in tonight's guests. Uh, first, let me bring in our, my friend, Professor Jennifer Murchia. She has written an amazing book uh, called Demagogue for President, the Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump. And she's an assistant professor of communications at Texas AM. And she's a historian. Um, of political rhetoric and has been analyzing Trump's use of rhetoric since 2015. God bless you, Jennifer. And then, of course, we have our Lincoln Project brethren, the co-founder Steve Schmidt here with us as well. Hello, Steve. We're going to start with you, though, Jen. Hi, Tara. How are you? Good, good, good. To be good. With you. <sighs> Jennifer, you, I, I don't even know how you've made it through this. As someone who studies political rhetoric, watching Donald Trump this closely for the last five years, how you're still smiling and haven't aged like 40 years because he is the embodiment of everything that you describe as a dangerous demagogue. And in your book, which um, I did read because I've interviewed you before on my podcast and I have your book right here because it's like, it's like a, um, a survival guide to Donald Trump rallies and speeches because you break down all these different techniques that he uses. But you talk about specifically the difference between um, what a demagogue in its purest form means and what a dangerous demagogue is. Would you explain why Donald Trump is a dangerous demagogue and give an example or two of some of the things that he, the rhetorical devices that he uses that are most popular? Yeah, so a demagogue for, you know, folks who haven't looked that word up lately, um, literally translates into a leader of the people. 
Um, and that's a neutral term, right? But uh, if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, it tells you that um, there's two contradictory definitions. The first one is a leader of the people who defends the people's interests against the other parts of the state. The second version is someone who uses polarizing propaganda for their own gain um, and who is essentially a leader of the mob. Um, and that's definitely the version of the word that we're more familiar with. Um, the thing that's so interesting about Donald Trump is that his followers believe that he is the heroic demagogue, that he is defending their interests against the other parts of the state, which they understand to be corrupt. Um, whereas everyone else, um, including the folks at the Lincoln Project, I think, um, see him as the villainous or the dangerous demagogue. And the way you can tell the difference, uh, because obviously the heroic demagogue, the villainous demagogue, you're going to call the one you don't like their policies dangerous and, you know, the one you do, you're going to call them a hero. But the way you can tell the difference is whether or not they are accountable, accountable to the rule of law, accountable to the will of the people. Um, and so why Donald Trump um, in particular is a dangerous demagogue is because he uses rhetoric in such a way that you can't hold him accountable. He uses language to prevent us from holding him accountable. He distracts us. He accuses his accusers. Um, he uses tricky uh, paralipses, which is a form of irony that allows him to say two things at once. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. And so he's really um, good at it, surprisingly good at it. And my dog has decided to jump in my lap and say hello. Oh, if this is a Friday <laughs> night, we'd be drinking. That's Pets part are of always our welcome game. on LPTV. That's right, that's right. <laughs> Too bad Tiki's not here. You would say hello, my cat. <laughs> so we're dog friendly. We're animal friendly here. Where the door was closed. <laughs> it's all right. It's we. It's it's a welcome reprieve. So you, well, Jennifer, let me ask you. Let me ask you a question, Jennifer. Uh, in in American political history, in in the recent in our in our in our in our living memory, there's never been a person in the Oval Office who has abused. The sort of rhetorical tricks uh, like Trump. I mean, he is pretty much sui generis in, in in the line of all presidents in our lifetimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Donald Trump is very successful in using rhetoric to. Um, well, essentially, he uses war rhetoric, but he uses it on a day to day basis. So uh, presidents typically, when they're preparing a nation for war, will use um, ad baculum threats of force. They'll use ad hominem, which is attacking the person instead of their argument. And in particular, they'll use reification. So that's treating people as objects. And the combination of those three things is essentially, like I said, a recipe for war rhetoric. And um, Donald Trump uses it every day. We've heard him use all three of those things just today, in fact. Steve, you have a question? Well, I, do you think that Trump, how, when you look at him right now and you, you evaluate how autocrats, how demagogues go down, how they fail, how the end comes about, are you seeing any patterns that are consistent with other people you've studied? Yeah. Um, you know, essentially reality creeps in. And, um, you know, I, I said this to a reporter way back in March, um, you know, when they asked how the virus was going to impact, you know, Trump's election chances. Um, and I said, you know, I think it depends on how miserable we are in November, um, you know, because that reality of our day-to-day -day lives um, really will impact whether Trump can, you know, pull his authoritarian P.T. Barnum routine successfully. Um, and I think we're pretty miserable. I mean, I'm homeschooling my kid, <laughs> trying to do my job. Um, you know, we're not able to see friends. Um, you know, I, we're not alone and, and we're not happy about that. And I think that, you know, a crisis provides an opportunity for a president. And so when historians examine, you know, the legacies of presidents, they look in particular for moments of crisis because it provides an opportunity to demonstrate leadership. 
And those presidents who historians believe are the calamitous presidents are those who failed the tests of leadership. In moments of crisis, they didn't lead and they left the nation worse off than they were before. And what I think we're seeing with Donald Trump and we'll see, you know, what happens with the election um, is, you know, that playing out in real time. We have the opportunity to say, you know, this is a failed president. This is a failure of leadership. And we are suffering as a nation, and it's his fault. You know, Jennifer, in in your book, you you break down these these six techniques that that Trump uses, and uh, you ticked off a couple of them. You used ad boculum, uh, ad hominem. Uh, you, there's also ad populum, uh, American exceptionalism, paralipsis, which is one of my favorites. You, you mentioned that the I'm not saying, I'm just saying, which is the conspiracy theory stuff. Um, and then reification. And you talk about this in, in, in your book, you talk about how Trump ran a campaign that was designed to increase frustration. Trump's campaign of distrust, polarization, and frustration was designed to take advantage of the rhetorical possibilities inherent in a nation in crisis. But in this case, it seems like he's not doing that. He's not taking advantage of a crisis like in the ad boculum example that you use with threats, he's he's doing the opposite almost. He's using these techniques, but not to help himself. It seems to be going the other way. Um, you use the term that he weaponizes rhetoric. Can you give an example of how he does that? Yeah, so weaponized rhetoric is using language as force. So, um, you know, Trump constantly says that he's a counter puncher, um, right? So he's always going to punch back 10 times harder or whatever. Uh, but most of the time, he's actually the one to land the first punch. And um, what I mean by weaponized communication or weaponized rhetoric is that it's um, it denies consent. It's anti-democratic. It's a form of compliance gaining instead of persuasion. So it's a, a, a strategy of of using propaganda, of doxing people, um, as, you know, sending your um, Twitter followers after them to attack. Those are all strategies that are designed to put pressure on the opposition. Um, and they're anti-democratic strategies because they deny the consent of the governed. Uh, and Trump used those to win. And when I talk about the crisis of um 2016, you know, it's a very different crisis, like you mentioned, from today. 2016, the crisis was, you know, distrust and polarization and frustration. He that the nation was divided. He exploited all of those negative qualities and new strategies that were designed to make him the reference so that we were even more divided. We were even more distrustful. Um, and you're right, uh, a, a smart um, authoritarian leader would have taken advantage of the current crisis. He would have rallied the nation. He would have acted as a protector and a defender, um, right? He would have given us reliable information that we could have used to keep ourselves and our families safe. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been most shocking to me over the last few months is the phone call with Bob Woodward that came out um, a few weeks ago, where you heard that Trump had good, solid information and was able to communicate it effectively to Bob Woodward about the virus uh, in February or early March. Um, and that information is stuff that he still denies today. Uh, and the difference between the performance of Trump as this leader during this crisis and what he knew behind the scenes, um, to me, is really shocking. Jennifer, compare Joe Biden's rhetorical style to Donald Trump's, and what's Biden doing right and wrong in this campaign? Yeah, if you would have asked me uh, in January or February, you know, is Biden going to be the candidate? I wouldn't have picked Biden <laughs> as the one. Um, and, and so I've been trying to make sense of why the Democrats picked him. Um, and in a way, I actually think that he is the right candidate for the moment. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with his rhetoric. So one of the things about Trump is that he has dominated 
our public sphere, right? He has completely set the nation's agenda for the past five years. Um, and he's done that primarily through outreach strategies. He outrages his base, which keeps them active and engaged, and they amplify his messages. He outrages his opposition, which keeps them attentive and engaged, and they amplify his messages. That serves him really well. Um, but outreach is good for one thing, and that's getting attention. It's not good for solving problems. Um, so Joe Biden, uh, you know, in distinction to Trump, is not running an outreach campaign, which is one reason, frankly, why I didn't think that he would, you know, get the nomination because I didn't think he'd get enough attention. Um, and so he's running a much quieter campaign. One thing that you see him do that um, Trump has not been able to do is um, to be presidential. He performs the presidency um, in a way that we're used to seeing. Trump says that's boring. He says he doesn't want to be presidential. He could be if he wanted to. He wants to be modern day presidential, he says, right? Which means he wants to use these outrage strategies. But in a crisis like this, we don't need modern day presidential. We don't need outrage. What we need is someone who can provide good information um, and can help see the nation through its difficulties. Uh, scholars of presidential rhetoric call that the priestly role of the presidency. Uh, during these moments of crisis, uh, the president calls the nation together. The president invokes our values, tells us how those values are going to see us through our present difficulties, rallies the nation together. Um, and Joe Biden can do that. Uh, he has played the priestly role over the last six months. He's constantly talking about our values, about how those values are going to unite the nation, how they're going to see us through the crisis of the virus. Um, and so I've actually been very impressed with his ability to seize the moment rhetorically. So Jen, that's um, the contrast between Joe Biden and Trump. It, I mean, it couldn't be starker. We say this all the time. We can't, couldn't get any more polar opposite. Um, and today, some of the things that that uh, Donald Trump said and uh, the, the, the rhetorical devices that he used are, are rather alarming. I want to run this and get your thoughts and explain to people what, out of the six rhetorical tactics that he uses, what he was using here so people can recognize them in real time. Go ahead, let's roll the You're a Criminal. The campaign strategy seems to be to call Biden a criminal. Why is that? He is a criminal. He's a criminal. He got caught. Read his laptop. And you know who's a criminal? You're a criminal for not reporting it. You are a criminal for not reporting it. Let me tell you something. Joe Biden is a criminal, and he's been a criminal for a long time. And you're a criminal in the media for not reporting it. Good luck, everybody. Have a good time. All right, Doc. Analyze so, it for us. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a very clear example, I would show this in my class even, um, of an ad hominem attack. So um, a classic um, ad hominem, the word ad is Latin for two, and it's a rerouting or a distraction technique. You take our attention away from the central question and you reroute our attention to the attack. And so um, the reporter is asking a legitimate question about Biden and Trump denies the question, denies the premise and instead attacks with the ad hominem. He is a criminal. You are a criminal. Um, don't ask me this question. You should report, you know, the stuff that I want you to report in the way that I want you to report. Um, and so now we can't have a conversation about um, the real question that was asked. And instead, our attention has been rerouted to the criminal question, which is, in fact, what we're talking about now. So he, he won. <laughs> okay. I think we have a tweet question from the Ask the Breakdown hashtag. Let's pull that up. All right, Jennifer, what do you think will be required to heal the country after Trump is out of office? What will it take for his blind followers to come to their senses? Oh, I wish I had a great answer for this. Um, you know, I live in Texas and um, I teach at a conservative university. My neighbors are Republicans. Um, some of them voted for Trump in 2016 and now are voting for Biden. Some of them um, are still voting for Trump. And we're all close. And, you know, we talk about politics and and everything um, all the time. And what I have realized is that the diehard Trump supporters who still support him, um, 
have some sort of like immunity um, that I think they've learned from Rush Limbaugh primarily, but you know, from right wing um, ecosystem over the last 20 years that says any fact that isn't consistent with our worldview is a lie. You can't trust any source except for the sources that we know are our sources. Um, any kind of objection that is brought up um, has to be turned into a tuquo quo which is um, an appeal to hypocrisy. So usually we hear this as what about ism or they do it too. Um, and so, you know, there are these like trigger reflexes that people have that they've developed. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating to try to argue with them um, and very frustrating because you say, well, the New York Times reported or the Associated Press reported or, you know, some source that you trust. And they go, no, you know, I can't, no, not, you know, it's not true. They're a lie, fake news. Um, and then you say, well, okay, but even if you don't trust that, you saw the video where he said, you know, Kamala Harris is a monster. Well, yeah, but that's politics and that's, you know, both sides, they all do that. And you say, but <laughs> that's terrible for democracy. And they say, well, you know, it's just the way it is. And so um, I haven't figured out yet how to pierce this, <laughs> um, you know, and I try, um, you know, the best way that I have figured is um, to open up a conversation where you're honest with people and you say, well, you know, in 2016, Hillary Clinton wasn't the best candidate. A lot of people thought Trump was a great businessman and that the nation, you know, needed to be led by somebody who was an expert in business. Mm -hmm. A lot of people thought he would be more presidential. You know, those reasons that people have given when they say um, why they voted for him in 2016. And, and that allows people to find common ground and to talk, but they have to have ears to hear, right? They have to be open to persuasion. And um, a lot of people aren't, you know, people in my family aren't. That is an aspect of, if you could answer that question, Jen, you would be a millionaire 10 times over. A lot of our guests try to answer that question. We try to answer that question. It's no one quite knows, you know, what it's, what it's going to take, but we do know that it's going to take someone that has the ability to heal the nation with a, that, that's a, that's a good demagogue. And I think that that would be <laughs> Joe Biden, which is why we're, we're working so hard to help get him elected and help heal the soul of the nation, as he says. Jen Murchia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, make sure you guys check out her no. book, Demagogue for President. No, Steve um, has a question. Oh, Steve does have a question? Oh, my God. Go ahead, Steve. Yep, one more. That <clears throat> When he did his thing today with Jeff Mason of Reuters, who's a great reporter and a and a nice person and the furthest thing from a criminal that you could could imagine, is that a shout out to QAnon when the conspiracy in essence is that is that the government is filled with criminals, that the media is in conspiracy with the criminals who who run the government, or is that an inadvertent uh hat tip to them yeah trump's been saying that since 2016 um you know the the conspiracy of corruption is what he ran on um and and how he was able to frame hillary clinton the media um established members of the republican party all as a part of you know the swamp the elite corrupt people who've made all these bad choices who've let the country fall apart um, and let the nation you know lose you know that's all been a part of his thing the whole time and conspiracy rhetoric is fascinating to me because um, you can't disprove it it's a self-sealing narrative kind of like um, when you roll over um, a nail you know with your car um, instead of puncturing it it um, you know it seals up and and conspiracy works that way logic and evidence are not allowed to count against it so it's fascinating because if you say, well, no, there's no evidence to support that, um, the conspiracist says they won't tell you the truth. And if you say, no, 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 okay, the evidence shows that didn't happen, they say they made that up. 
<laughs> right? And if you say, no, well, there's no evidence to prove your case, they say they're hiding it, right? So the logic of conspiracy itself prevents us from ever puncturing um, the conspiracy theory. And um, so it's very dangerous. And it also puts you in a very powerful position. If you're the one who can wield the conspiracy, you can accuse people of doing something. Um, it doesn't matter if it didn't happen because you now have thrown suspicion on these other people and you're not a stooge. Um, and so it's really powerful and Trump loves conspiracy. Uh, he's a connoisseur and a purveyor of conspiracy and it served him well. It's a way for him to avoid responsibility well, so too, for... right? Absolutely, absolutely, because it doesn't matter if it didn't happen. Right, hey, another one. Jennifer, before we let you go, I, have, I, I just wanna practice my paralypsis for a moment. <laughs> I'm not saying Donald Trump should be eaten by wolves, but <laughs> is that is that? Is <laughs> but many people are saying, Rick. You have to put the many people so are saying trouble. in there. Many people are saying. Yes, many I, many people are saying that. <laughs> that dot dot. Many wolves are hungry. <laughs> many wolves are hungry. <laughs> and oh paralysis is funny. Very rewarding. Everyone loves the paralysis. <laughs> Except when the Thanks president of the United States well, is Well, thank you again for being crazy. with us tonight, Jennifer. We really appreciate it. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Keep up the good work, y'all. You too. Thank, thank you. you. When I say that her book is like a is like a survival guide, it really is. I, I mean, I after reading it, and I've never watched another Donald Trump rally speech anytime he speaks ever the same way ever again because I think in my mind, he's doing that, that, you know, that's ad boculum, that's ad hominem, that's paralypsis, because mm -hmm. it's, he's like, he is a, a textbook case for, for uh, a bad demagogue, Absolutely. you know, it's, it's crazy. Well, it, well, Jennifer uh, was a great guest tonight. And, and, you know, one of the things that's unusual about Trump is he's usually the person who makes people mad. The next ad you're going to see is a variation on one of our first big things that made Trump mad at the Lincoln Project. Um, our famous ad, Morning in America, received something like 7 million views. Uh, we are now rolling out with morning spots in key swing states. And let's roll the Morning in Ohio ad. Uh, these are rolling out in, in swing states. As Donald Trump is pulling down his media buys, uh, Joe Biden and the Lincoln Project and others are expanding theirs. So folks in Ohio, Iowa, Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and other places will be seeing the variations of this ad. There's morning in Ohio. Today, hundreds of thousands of Americans have died from a deadly virus Donald Trump ignored, praising China's response instead of heeding the warnings, then blaming them to cover his own failures. With the economy in shambles, people across Ohio are still out of work the worst economy in decades. This afternoon, millions of Americans will apply for unemployment. And with their savings run out, many are giving up hope. Millions worry that a loved one won't survive COVID-19. There's mourning in Ohio. And under the leadership of Donald Trump, our country is weaker and sicker and poorer. And now, Americans are asking, if we have another four years like this, will there even be an America? You know, those morning you know, ads are really powerful because this is exactly why Donald Trump is losing so badly. You know, this is impacting real people's lives. It reminds them of what his failed leadership looks like. So in his whole, only I can fix it. Remember that whole thing in 2016? Well, only he has created this disaster and failure. And I think our, our morning ads are really exemplifying that for folks. Really an amazing story today about the fact that, and Tara alluded to it earlier, which is that there is a radiologist who was right. a Fox News commentator. Right. Right, that Trump saw on Fox is now in charge of the federal government's right. pandemic response. And, and as a result, I mean, we had we had three thousand Americans killed 
and it sent the, the country to war for 20 years. Mm -hmm. This 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 fool, this quack doctor, mm -hmm. is going to be responsible with Trump, with the others, for for killing hundreds of thousands of people who wouldn't have otherwise be killed. It's just the irresponsibility of it all is 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 beyond both comprehension and explication. It it, it really is, and when you see this guy trying to 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 backdoor in this idea of herd immunity where the minimum number of people to die if we do the herd immunity route is two and a half million. Can you imagine a president of this country saying, I'm going to accept two and a half million deaths for something we could manage by wearing masks and distancing? It is an astounding moral vacuum. Sure is. It, it, it is. And it's Meanwhile, the, the president's continued collapse. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's the choice that the American people are, are making on the, on the ballot. That's what's on the ballot. It's literally, do you want a president that has that has leadership that will allow two and a half million people to die versus someone who would mm -hmm. listen to the real doctors and scientists and health professionals whose job it is to do no harm and protect life? That's the bottom line here. That's what people are voting for. So it's astonishing to me how many yep. Americans are willing to cast that choice aside as if it doesn't exist. They live literally in an alternate universe. And then you have the, the other side of this. You have the president running around with this absurd Hunter Biden story, which were, you know, it's even Fox News wouldn't run it for goodness sakes because of, of how problematic the sourcing of it was. Um, and the president is calling anybody else criminals and dumbasses and 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 stupid bastards or whatever he's saying the projection here is pretty obvious but the fact that he's got the nerve to to, to point the finger at everybody else accusing them of what he does and what he is every single day it's it's hard to it's 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 really hard to believe that this is what we're looking at 15 days before the election and that it's not a landslide already i, I mean that it's even close anywhere is amazing to me but in the meantime, let's see how the big game went on Saturday. This is one of our new ads, The Swamp. Ben Hill Griffin Stadium, also known as The Swamp. Following the example set by Donald Trump, Gators coach Dan Mullen demands 90,000 fans pack the stadium this weekend for the big game against LSU despite COVID-19, despite over 200,000 deaths. The Gators coach wanted to create the best game day atmosphere possible until 21 Florida football players test positive for COVID-19, forcing the game to be postponed. So many voted for Trump because he promised to drain the swamp. As I said, we would drain the swamp, and that's exactly what we're doing right now. And because of his failure, this swamp is drained. Of not just fans, but of football itself. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. It is a remarkable thing, it, it, one of the many things that Trump's mishandling of COVID has cost this country, which is these beloved traditions of the fall, include, uh, uh, of, of any time of year, really. But you know, the beloved tradition of, of SEC football in the South is kind of a thing. And we are now in a position where, you know, w when a place like Ben Hill Griffin is going to be empty now because of the mismanagement of this pandemic, uh, these things start to ripple through society a little more than we had expected in the beginning. And, and we've talked about this a lot, about how you know, we've lost this giant chunk of American cultural continuity because of this mishandling of this disease, how badly you screwed it up. Oh, for sure. I mean, the American way of life, you think about all of the weddings, the bar mitzvahs, mm -hmm. the first communions, the number of grandparents who couldn't be there for the birth of their grandchildren, sure. um, football proms yeah. the, the list goes on i mean the the incompetence of all of this has has profoundly disrupted the education 
of every kid in the in right. the country. I mean, your kids stress, are going through stress it. Stress the parents, and I and I think that you know, as a parent, right, you try to do the best you can, but look, I mean, it takes extraordinary, you know, qualities, I think, to teach children mm -hmm. effectively, and, you know, I don't, I don't possess any of them, <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, I mean, raised by wolves, you know, and I, it's just, you just, you just sit and you shake your, you, you yeah. sit and you shake your head, and, you know, look, we're in, you know, here in Utah, the hospitals are at capacity. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is becoming a really serious situation in this moment right now. Yep. You know, with the trajectory of the of the cases, and it's just not none of this, none of this had to happen. Had to happen. None of it. None of it had to happen. It wouldn't have happened. If Barack Obama was president. It wouldn't have happened if George W. Bush was president. Nope. Just it wouldn't have happened. Well, you know, one of the things that isn't going to happen is Donald Trump's not going to get his way on the topics for the debate this week. <laughs> um, they objected to the fact that the debate commission today and Kristen Welker from NBC, uh, they released the topics, fighting COVID-19, American families, race in America, climate change, national security, and leadership. The Trump campaign did not like these topics, and now they're having a stompy foot hissy fit about them. And campaign manager Bill Stepien a guy whose who's tenure as campaign manager since Brad Parscal took the money and ran <laughs> has consisted mostly of sitting in his office in the dark looking at spreadsheets and weeping softly. So we've got a letter he sent to the debate commission today, which was one of the most, one of the most whiny and, 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 and cringy examples of self-pity that I've ever seen in a campaign. It flows part from the head. Is, part of this idea that they want to change the subject here, Tara, is that is that they're pulling down their ad buys everywhere. Their vendors are looking nervously at them and wondering if they're going to be like guys who built the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. And, and the campaign has fallen apart. We hear from inside the campaign all the time and the White House, this thing is a train wreck. It is, it is going south. Stepien and Jason Miller are trying to knife each other every day. Uh, Jared is starting to, to eyeball the exits as well. So the campaign is in a very deep death spiral. And, you know, it, those folks all know it. Oh, yeah, of course they do. Usually you don't see people, first of all, you don't see people behaving like this until if they know that they're winning. It's usually because they know they're losing. I mean, they were even knifing each other in 2016 right. <laughs> because they thought they were going to lose on election night you already you saw that the, the knives are out and so all of this whining and bitching and complaining my god i tweeted this the other day like I, for someone who's supposed to be such a tough guy mr macho man good gracious donald trump whines and bitches all the time and the people around him do his bidding and do the same thing like i said it flows from the head um and it, they're just trying to change the subject because they want they want it to be foreign policy which i i don't know how that helps them because our foreign policy <laughs> is a disaster we're a laughing stock around the world and joe biden could come in and and simply explain how uh you've been in bed with Putin, you're writing love letters to Kim Jong Un. You know, you look at all the things that you did with Turkey. You sold out our Kurdish allies. You have foreign investments in business in X, Y, and Z. You know, a authoritarian country. I mean, I don't see how foreign policy helps them any, but it's anything to change the subject from what's happening with COVID and how the economy is. People are still suffering. That's that's the bottom line. But the but the debate. Oh, there is news about the debate commission. Apparently, they have a mute button. The mute button is there, but it's only going to be used when the, per the person answers for the first two minutes. So that they can speak uninterrupted for two minutes. Uninterrupted, I guess, as best as you can define that. If, if Donald Trump wants to walk over to him or linger around or do whatever or shout at him over the mic, I guess he could do that. But for the audience, um, it will be there will be some form of a mute button. So it's, I guess, like mute light for the debate commission. And Kirsten Welker attacking her ahead of time. Again, another successful woman, woman of color this time that Donald Trump is going after. And uh, it's just, it's just pathetic. It just, he's just such a small, weak, insecure man. And that's all this, this is. Cause he's scared of another powerful woman putting him in his place like Savannah Guthrie did last week. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, do you have anything to add? Just... Well, 
I just, it's extraordinary, right? Like the president of the United States believes he's victimized because there are going to be questions about leadership right. and the deadly pandemic that's killed over 200,000 Americans, God forbid, right. right? You know, there's no, there's no bad questions, only bad answers. And that's what, that's what the problem is. And he's, look, this is, this is all going down. It's all collapsing. And the stories that you see this week about people talking about are we going to be able to get jobs? No. <laughs> and, and, and the answer is no. 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 Um, most of these people in the White House um, will not be hired um, in corporate America, by PR firms, by associations, the usual type of places. No one in the press office will be a network analyst. I think that most of the analysts on any given network, including the reporters, would threaten to resign in mass. Absolutely. You know, there was one story talking about, but the people who work for Mike Pence, they'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's like, wow, right? I mean, you know, there's such a bill coming due. I, you know, look, I think if you're like a staffer at the FCC, mm -hmm. right, and you're working on regulatory policy, right, right there's going to be, hey, you know, I worked at the FCC, I'm going to be okay, or I was here or there. But, you know, people who have ownership of the politics of this era, who went out and were party to the 30,000 lies, to the caging of children, to the ineptitude of the response. I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that's on my mind in the, in the final two weeks of this is there's, there's three things that just drive me particularly crazy in this moment. The first is that whack job who was on CNN, Michael Caputo, oh, who, was, who was put over to HHS mm -hmm. and, and, and wantonly, blatantly interfered with the CDC's yep. ability to communicate yep. accurate information to the American people until he had a mental breakdown mm -hmm. and was talking about the fact that we were going to see an armed insurrection, right? right? So, so this whack job, right, is the, is the person who's interfering with the, with the CDC. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a meeting, and I, I, I can't, is someone who, who walked into the West Wing every day for, for work, there was a meeting that Jared Kushner led where it, was, where it was affirmatively, premeditatively decided, mm -hmm. screw the blue states, that the mm -hmm. politics of this would wash up on blue state governors and therefore we weren't going to have a national response. Mm -hmm. You see this continuing, by the way, with the refusal to give federal aid to the state of California, right. which badly needs it, suffering through catastrophe. 38 million Americans live in California, mm -hmm. right? We have, we have significant military installations, significant military population in the state, significant part of the economy of the country mm -hmm. yep. from the state. Not going to give disaster aid to, to California. And then lastly, again, the story today about this wacko bird radiologist who is hijacked Right. The pandemic response of the federal government. I mean, if you put this into a script and try okay. to sell this as a story about some presidency that had completely gone off the rails, it would be too on the nose. Completely right. so out and out of space right. that no one no, they, no one they, would ever they, no one would ever green light it. They tell you just, dial this down like a hundred percent. It's too right. crazy. And it's and 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 you just think about it, party that's supposedly pro life. Is going to be responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of people because of all of this fucking stupidity. It's it is it is it will be studied for a hundred years, and 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 it will be hard to wrap people's minds around it all. And you look at the Ben Sasses in the in the wanton revisionism that's starting now. Oh, yes. in the last in the <laughs> last two weeks, it's just. A, it's going to be an incredible couple of weeks. So I have one piece of advice for all these people. Maggie Haberman wrote a great piece today that included a line that enraged Donald Trump. And one of our sources in the campaign uh, told me this afternoon that anybody gets caught with a resume out floating around, there's going to be <laughs> terrible consequences. If you're working for the campaign or if you're one of these people in the White House, here's what I recommend you do when you're looking for a job in January. On your resume, from the period that you entered the administration until no election day, you should put in something like, you ran an international drug ring, or <laughs> you were smuggling heroin, 
or you ran a chop shop in Detroit, because that'll look better on your resume than being in the Trump White House or the Trump campaign. I was, I was distracted by the lure of ISIS for several years. <laughs> it would be a better right. I saw. I saw. I, saw, I lost my I way to establish a caliphate. <laughs> I mean. Well, I mean, the Taliban. The Taliban may be hiring since they're supporting Donald. They endorse Donald Trump, so there's always that option, I guess. Oh my god! Go goodness. Taliban! Good yeah, drink. MAGA, make <laughs> Afghanistan great again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we have a live caller. Hey, so Tara. Yeah. I mean, there's like an outside shot that like Google would hire John Walker Land or something, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> why not? I mean, <laughs> at this point. Hey, Tara. Yeah. Who's sexy and he knows it? Oh, that list is long. We have a clip. We have a clip. It's hot. Hey, guys. Hope you're doing well. Just watching my algorithms get crushed. I guess I did something to piss off the Instagram gods. So hopefully you're seeing this stuff anyway. We'll do what we can. Talk to you soon. (laughs) Oh, my God. I'm just going to go ahead and argue that getting your algorithms crushed is what happens when you're with Kimberly Guilfoyle? I, mean. I I have several things like that that I feel like are important to talk about with this. Um, first off, um, what 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 is on top of him? What, what is, is that? that? What, what is, is it? That? Is it a comforter, a duvet, a, a, a binky? I don't and know. Is that, and what's with the wallpaper behind him? Is that wallpaper? And what's with the lights and they're so bright you could do surgery? I find it to be very odd. I have a whole bunch of questions. I, mean, I, I have so many questions, the least of which have to do with the algorithm. It's like, was he filming himself? Was it Kimberly? Did Kimberly say it was a good did idea? Did they have the film crew from their reality show in there, in bed with them? I, there's a whole spectrum of options here. and They're all disturbing nightmare fuel. Speaking the- of disturbing nightmare fuel, do we have any audience questions this evening? Anybody on the line? Anybody on the Zoom? We do. <clears throat> Let's bring him in. Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, so my name's, Hi. My name's hey Daniel. There. What's your name? I'm Daniel Mazzarina, um, and hey, I'm, actually, I'm at Belmont University right now. i um, really excited about this week's debate, actually. Um, but nice. I'm actually a North Carolina native, uh, and so I have a lot of friends both at home and here in Nashville um, who are either raised Republican or just have families that are kind of leaning conservative. And they're maybe, maybe disinterested isn't the right word but they're kind of not invested in politics and they see sort of a both sidesism approach a lot of the time. And like that Don Jr. clip that you guys just pulled, I think that's hilarious and I think that's pathetic. But like they would see that and just sort of be like, oh, (laughs) and scroll. And my question to you is, how do I convince these kids who are friends of mine who are, like I said, raised Republican or leaning conservative, how do I convince them to vote blue in their first ever election when they haven't been seeing the things that we've been seeing for the past four years and sort of following Trump like a hawk and watching all of the dumb crap he's done. Well, gentlemen, uh, you want to take a crack at that? I have my own theory, but <laughs> I'll let I'm you sure Rick will have you a start. really funny answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that you're not going to be able to convince them. If anything, you know, in that situation, it's one of those where it's like convince them well, if you're not going to vote for America and you want to vote for Trump, then maybe you should not vote this election and stay home. Um, I mean, unfortunately, there's there's for some sometimes it takes experience. You know, people have to they have to look at how this impacts them. You know, it, I would throw it back on them and and I would say, would you be okay with this if if, if Donald Trump talked to your sister that way? Or would you be okay with it? You know, how many people do you know that have have suffered under this? You know, you have to personalize it. I mean, it's different for everyone. Only you know your friends. But if you sometimes you just can't fix stupid, and you know, it takes it takes people's experience in life and having to pay a price for their decisions before they change. Oftentimes, and you know, folks your age, uh, sometimes you, as my as my husband would say, uh, a hard head makes a soft behind. So. Sometimes you have to learn the hard way. <laughs> That's my answer to that. Gentlemen. I was, I was I was thinking about the inspiring words of my old scoutmaster, Larry Myers, who, okay. who who would say to us frequently, Boys, 
grab your ears, bend over, and pull your heads out of your asses <laughs> um, as an inspiration. Look, I would say to these to to your friends, right? Like, if this guy was in the cockpit of the airplane, right? Wouldn't they pop up and try to blow the hatch and get the fuck off of it before <laughs> before it took off? I right? would hope. Like for sure, that's what I would do. Yeah. Right. I, can I also say, are you in a dorm room? That's incredible. I had concrete walls when I yes, was in a dorm right? room in college. Yes, I it's am like in a dorm room. being in an room. institution. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank Plus, you, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're going to be kind of locked will. in. We're going to be kind of locked in the day of the debate, which sort of sucks. I kind of thought, you know, we'd be able to see it in person. But, you know, when the coronavirus has been mishandled for eight months, I guess you kind of get what you paid for. <laughs> Take all these guys out drinking the night before the election. Yeah, that's important, Daniel. <laughs> Get them lit. Get them hammered. That's that's a form. That's a form of voter make sure suppression. They can't, make sure they can't get up before six p.m. <laughs> All right. Well, Daniel, We're counting on you, Daniel. I think I think the the overall thrust of this argument here is win the fights you can win, right? And and move the people you can move, but don't try to take somebody who is a deep, hard, dyed in the wool MAGA and flip them. It's just going to frustrate you. And, 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 and it's not going to get you to the X, as we like to say. But, you know, and again, Steve's absolutely right. Take those some bitches out drinking that night. <laughs> Lots. Jägermeister. Something else. Like, something in that category. All right. I mean, the projectile I was, I was... vomiting is worth them not voting. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I mean, I just hope that they would be able, like, a lot of them seem to forget, like, they're, you know, maybe Christian and leaning conservative, leaning conservative. They seem to forget that Joe Biden's a practicing Catholic. I feel like that right. hasn't hit them hard enough either, too, you know, but there's he just, actually like goes I said, to it's church. just a lot of, exactly. It's just a lot of them not paying a whole lot of attention, I think. And so hopefully, you're, hopefully you're right. Hopefully I, I can distract them the night before. <laughs> <laughs> But in, in honesty, well, Daniel, thanks so much, man. Keep the faith. Honestly, stay in the no, fight. Keep the only fight. if they're over twenty-one. <laughs> oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Daniel. Or not? No. <laughs> so, so firm, who's, who's right? Next? Well, Burn. We, we have to. We have to be it's responsible, so guys. We have to be responsible. We can't. We can't be seen as. <laughs> As you advocating know us? underage <laughs> drinking, it's illegal. <laughs> What's now? Who's up next? It's extraordinary times, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm trying to protect us. In your opinion, what will the end of Trump's presidency look like from November 3rd through January 20th? <sighs> I, we don't know. You know. Well, That's for even sure. You have for sure. You're not going to see the visit of the president-elect with the president. It won't happen. Won't happen. Won't you won't it. see the pickup and the rituals of the peaceful transition of power. I'd be, you know, anybody who thinks Shocked. Donald Trump is going to sit on the dais there, he will. He will not. The, the transition um, teams will not cooperate. Right. The, the 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 Trump movement will do everything they can. I think to impose as many regulations as possible, to gum up the government as much as possible, they'll be as destructive as possible. It a lot will be, of executive orders. Right, a lot of executive orders. It'll they'll do everything they can um, to make as much mess as possible. And um, the the defeated Trump people will try to impose immediately this alternate reality mm -hmm. he was stabbed in the back cheated. he was cheated 30 percent of the country will be there and you know what's going to be so amazing in this moment is that one of the groups that will be accused of stabbing him in the back are all of the senators and members of congress mm -hmm. who will say we're not tough enough we're not hard enough the ben sasses of the world Marco. for example mm -hmm. the marcos that you know, with all their silent complicity, it wasn't enough. So they'll be attacked. So the thing that they thought was that they were preventing with the with the base over these years is going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. this month. But it's it's going to be it's going to be a mess, um, and it's going to be really unpredictable. I, I like to say that the that most of the scientific modeling of this 
leans towards a radioactive Mad Max hellscape filled with cannibal mutants, fire, and destruction. Uh, but that's just Stephen Miller. Anyway, <laughs> I think we have another caller. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I just want to, my name's Miriam. I just want to say that, um, Rick, you are the Justin Bieber of all political geek women. So <laughs> without the hair. <laughs> Just that you know. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I guess that makes me a believer. <laughs> uh, thank you. Lots of love out there. You have no idea. Lots of love out there. Um yeah, so I thank I, you. I wanted to discuss a couple of things. So I voted for John McCain in 2008. Um, I am okay. the typical perfect black conservative. I am a professional. I have a law degree. I make six figures. I'm voting for Joe Biden this year. And the problem I think right now the Republican Party has after, after Trumpism or Trump leaves is that there is a group of African Americans who were raised by African American parents who told us the Republican Party are racist. They're against you. Um, the last four years have not done anything to help that argument, right? So I think after the Trump is out of office for like expanding the base, what do you guys think that Republicans are gonna have to do to bring African Americans, Latino, LGBTQ plus, who've been degraded and humiliated and watching women of color being named mispronounced and told to go back to another country. How is the Republican Party, who I believe in 2008, part of their platform was expanding the party, you guys have shrunk it to like some proud boys and some uh, white supremacists. And every African American professional I know who was Republican says to me, I will never be Republican again because everything I thought they were, they are. And I know you guys can say that Trump came and took over the party. If he has a 98% approval rating, he is the party. So that's my question. What is the what, what do you think the game plan is going to be to bring us back in to a party that Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell are the superstars? I'll take the... Well, uh, I you know, I think. Go ahead, Steve. Well, I was going to say, sorry, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I think that the party's going to get crazier in defeat. And the analogy that I've made, it's like a white star that's collapsing. As that star collapses, that supernova, it gets smaller, but it gets denser and it gets it gets hotter. And so one of the things that's true is the Republican Party is smaller than it was four years ago, yeah. smaller than it was six months ago. And as the party shrinks and it will shrink more, it just gets hotter and more extreme. So there's 180 Q candidates. There'll be 1,800 in two years, right? There might be 18,004. But these elements that have been let loose in the parties, the Bugaloo boys, the militia people, the Proud Boys, the alt right, the alt right, the white nationalists, all of all of these people have been encouraged and mainstreamed by Trump. And you can't exist in a political coalition, in my view, with these people. I say that as a white 50 year old. I, I can't be in a political party with these people. And so you have this element that is an autocratic movement. You have the religious extremism that's typified by the Jerry Falwell Juniors, the hypocrisy, the Billy Graham Juniors, the uh, Pastor Paul is in the White House. And all of it has to be burned to the ground, right? There, but there's no coming back for the Republican Party. What it, what it will do is it will become smaller and smaller and more extreme, and it will function in American life like the California Republican Party does in that state, which is an extremist organization that's mostly concerned about its internal politics and hunting heretics and 
concerned with a social media ecology around it, but can't win elections, can't govern responsibly, and isn't part of the public policy making process. But you know, this isn't a consumer product that's going to bounce back and reform after a humiliating defeat. It's it's going to get worse, and it's going to go on for a long time until these most noxious elements are completely repudiated. And and at the end of the day, you know, Rick and Tara, th- th- this whole thing comes down to a dividing line. You either think that the promise of the country is for everybody, right, right, or you don't. And and I think that we are all on the side that it's for everybody, mm-hmm. right? It includes African-Americans, Hispanic Americans, the LGBT community. If you work hard, you play by the rules, you work hard and you're a good American, you shouldn't be limited in any type right. of way, right, by, by who you are, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that's it. And we have, a, we have a lot of people in the Republican Party who are deeply invested in making it harder for people to vote, to express their franchise, to be treated equally in the society. And that, that's what the line is. And, and there are a lot of these people who'd want to, want to say, no, America's not a propositional nation. It's a blood and soil equation. Mm-hmm. And that's why you get Trumpian rhetoric about shithole countries and saying we can't have these immigrants from th- these, these Islamic immigrants, these Islamic refugees, because they're so fundamentally different, they can never be Americans. And uh, I'd make the argument that that Humian Khan was more American than Donald Trump has ever been. For sure. You know, and, and, and these people that, that have come to this country and built so much over so many generations, um, you know, I, I know that doesn't completely answer the question. I know we lost the caller, but Tara, do you want to r- r- ring out on that one? I was just going to add that um, the acknowledgement that the Republican Party has um, returned back to the racist Southern strategy days of the 60s and 70s is um, it's hurtful. Um, And as someone who has been a part of the Republican Party for 25 plus years, trying to convince people just like our caller and, and, and her professional friends that the Republican Party actually is the Big Ten Party and that, you know, the Democrats haven't done um, anything to help the minority communities and, and, and uh, anything to help put forth the what we believe in and empowering the individual are ladders of opportunity and all I've done is throw money at the situation and you know all of those arguments that we used as conservatives that has gone down the drain it has no credibility anymore because of under the Republican tent anyway because the direction the party went in Stuart Stevens book was a really tough read for me it was all a lie I mean Stuart He's, he's been around a little longer and involved in, in a few more campaigns than me, a lot more. But for him to talk about how, uh, just the example after example of things that we used to, I used to think were just um, aberrations, but it seemed to be more the rule than it was the exception with the, with the way that racism was tolerated. And uh, the only answer I have for her is that the, the party needs to be burned to the ground which the, the Trumpism aspect of the party apparatus needs to be burned to the ground. And the, the principles behind what conservatism is and what Republicanism is, not Trumpism, those do not change. And it will take other messengers in order to build it back up. Or if the party is completely unsalvageable, after if Donald Trump wins again, God forbid, then perhaps it's a, it goes the way of the Whigs and a new party is formed. But um, there has to be a reckoning. There has to be a reckoning. And I don't know how anyone who is a a person of color at this point can look at Donald Trump and the way the Republican Party has conducted itself and feel as though they're welcome there. Because the people that are are there now, the the black faces that they put forward now are simply there as tokens. And it's to give a, a racial fig leaf to white Americans who are who have no problem with bigotry and racism and white supremacy. And that's what that's about. And it's not okay. And so we'll see what happens after November 4th, but it will take burning it to the ground in order to fumigate the party of that stench. Well, on that note, let's see if we've got another caller or a tweet. Familiar face. Hi there, you're <laughs> muted. Hello. Hi. 
Uh, uh, hey, how are you? I'm fine. How are you guys? We're good. Doing, okay. doing the job. On a lighter note, I have a question. I know that okay. at the end of every administration, as the outgoing president is leaving, he leaves a letter for the incoming president. What do you think Donald Trump is going to write in that letter? And do you think it's going to be written with crayons? <laughs> Man, woman, person, TV. <laughs> <laughs> There, there you have it, Marianne. Oh. Just, just as a note, Marianne is our first repeat caller. Uh, you weren't with us, I don't think, the first night we had Marianne, Rick. So that's why I said familiar face. because she Oh, was, welcome back, Marianne. She has come back to join us. She's out there in California. And you're a poll worker, right? Yes, and I'm still terrified to do it. I'm still afraid something's well, going to happen. Good for you, Marianne. That's Nope. That's a civic. That's a civic good that 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 I encourage people who feel like they can do it safely to do, and I'm I'm really delighted you're doing that. I'm so excited about it. I have been looking forward to it all year, and the closer it gets, the more frightened I get, but the more excited I'm getting because it'll be an end to the madness, hopefully. That's but right. I would What's the definition of courage? Well, yeah. I'm, I am courage. mustering up my courage to do it. But Oh, and I wanted to tell you courage. that the Carson City 56-second video that you guys put out today, I did a spit take when watching that. It was hysterical. <laughs> it's, been, it's been pointed out before that you know, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the idea that there's something worth more than the fear. And our democratic process and uh, hundreds of thousands of poll workers who are going to make sure this is a fair election, you know, each one of them is serving their country, is serving, you know, the history of the country and doing their part for American democracy. So good for you. Congratulations. And, uh, you know, we honor your courage here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank See, you there you go, Marianne. So much. You got encouragement and I hope from that someday we night. find out what he writes on that letter to to the new president. <laughs> May, I, I suspect it'll be in the form of a, a letter. I'm and, uh, it'll be in the form of a tweet. So there you go, Marianne. You got <laughs> like advice Fileo from fish wrappers. Yeah, or <laughs> you got advice from me, from Rick, and from the Steve Schmidt. So not too many folks can say that they've had that opportunity. <laughs> you we guys appreciate are wonderful. You, thank you so thank much you so for much. everything you're doing. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we got a tweet. Yes. <laughs> yes, we will. Will LP will LPTV be covering yeah. election returns on November third? Yes, we will. It's going to be a long night. There may be, there, there may be cocktails involved. Yeah, I was going to say, Can, who, who's going to make the drink? I'm just picturing, <laughs> just picturing they find the filet fish wrappers under the Lincoln, the Lincoln bed, and they <laughs> right. send him the Quantico to decode the invisible ink. That's, that's the letter. Oh, my gosh. Oh, shit. Oh. Okay, what do we got next, guys? I think that it, we are wrapping it up for tonight on the with the imagery of right. Leia fish wrappers all over the Lincoln bedroom and the residence. Um, thank you for that visual. You're welcome for the nightmare fuel, America. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, before we go, we want to do our quick call to action. Um, as we started last week, you heard us talk about a partnership with Democracy Labs. It's the See, Say, See Something, Say Something 2020 initiative. CSA2020.com is where you can go to report instances of voter suppression. If you observe it, you can go to that website or you can use the hashtag CSA2020 and they will help investigate it. So make sure you have any detail where you are, what happened. And uh, the See, See Something, Say Something 2020 initiative will help look into that. So we want to try our best to uncover any voter suppression and make sure that it is not successful. We truly hope that no one encounters this. But since Steve Schmidt made a Boy Scout reference, I will make another one as well. 
be prepared. All right, Rick, before we go. Be prepared. Be prepared. That's right. My husband was a Boy Scout. I was a Girl Scout while I was a Brownie. My husband was a Boy Scout, so we often say corny Boy Scout and Girl Scout. I was a Boy things. Scout until the flare gun incident. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to tell us that one. Well, before night, we Rick. go, folks, please check out our sister show. Every... <laughs> before we go, folks, please check out our sister show, Vote for America. It is on every day, hosted by Jennifer Horn, our good friend. It airs daily at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find it streaming on the Lincoln Ch Project's YouTube channel. Um, and uh, it is a great show. They're getting better all the time. Lisa and, and um, Jennifer put on a, a, get some fantastic guests, and they're digging deeper into the election and the details every day. I uh, hope you'll tune in. Hope you'll, we'll see you guys again here on The Breakdown next time. And uh, we, will, uh, we will have more tweets, more live calls, more hijinks and frivolity. <laughs> you have a good night, America. But wait, before we go, though, Rick, there's two oh, things wait. left. But wait, there's more. Since You're we're going right. With I'm our so theme. sorry. That's okay. Tomorrow night, when you come back and join us, we will have with us Rachel Vinman. I, I forgot her first name. That is Lieutenant Colonel Vinman's wife. And we, the Lincoln Project and Vote Vets, did a collaborative ad with them. Um, discussing the bullying and the uh, intimidation tactics by this president on Lieutenant Colonel Vindman for simply speaking the truth during the impeachment hearing. And him and his wife have been very brave in speaking out about what happened to them. So Rachel Vindman will be joining us along with Fred Wellman, who is also one of our Lincoln Project advisors, and he specializes in veterans and um, <clears throat> veteran issues. So Fred and Rachel will be with us tomorrow night. And we leave you with a clip from Ron Steslow on the podcast with Dr. Natasha Kothuria about the unseen health costs of COVID-19. Now we can say good night. Thank you to Jennifer Morchia and thank you, Steve Schmidt. And thank you, Rick Lester. Good night, folks. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. But the magnitude of the tragedy is so much bigger than mm. 200,000 deaths. If mm. you looked in New York City, for example, during the surge of COVID-19, and you calculate the number of deaths from COVID-19, and then you look at the excess death rate, that's what we need to look at. And I, I guarantee you, when we get to 2021, mm -hmm. and we look back and we calculate the excess death rate, that's non-COVID-19 deaths from 2020, it's going to be exceptionally higher than the five years prior, mm. starting in February, starting when COVID-19 came into the picture. And that's multiple reasons. COVID-19, of course, is a risk as a virus itself. Yes, it causes heart attacks. It causes strokes. It causes blood clots. It causes respiratory failure. It causes everything bad, multi-organ system failure, horrible things, death, trauma, morbidity, suffering. All of these things happen from the virus. But what we're not looking at is that when the virus hits a community, that community suffers from all the other things.
Good evening, Mr. Thank President. You. Thank you very much. I have to say, you have a great smile. <laughs> You're so handsome when you smile. <laughs> okay.